Welcome back, everyone. Bree, what's on your radar today? Well, Amber, Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel's army is the most moral army in the world. Well, on Monday, Israel bombed a food convoy, killing seven humanitarian workers delivering food to over two million Gazans who are now starving to death because Israel is limiting food supplies to the Gaza Strip. The humanitarian workers who worked with the famed chef Jose Andres organization World Central Kitchen included three British nationals, a 43-year-old Australian, a 25-year-old Palestinian, a 25-year-old Polish man, and a 33-year-old with dual U.S.-Canadian citizenship. Here's what you need to know about the attack. The roof of the truck was clearly labeled as a World Central Kitchen truck, as you can see here in this photo. And the aid workers reportedly shared their location with the Israeli government before moving through what has been described as a deconflicted zone. And yet, their convoy of three cars was not struck just once, but three separate times. In a sequence that evokes a tragic if not sadistic, through a little pig's tail. After the first car was hit, survivors fled to another vehicle, at which point that car was hit, and survivors ran to the third vehicle, where the third Israeli airstrike finally killed all of them. Not even a proverbial house of brick could withstand an Israeli drone attack. A humanitarian van didn't stand a chance. Israel is now telling two conflicting stories about what happened. In one story, the IDF suggests the attack was justified because they had identified an armed person at the warehouse from which the convoy had picked up supplies. Note, they do not allege that this alleged armed person was actually a part of the humanitarian convoy, merely that an armed person had been spotted at a warehouse where the convoy had been. Now, it might occur to you that even if this alleged armed person exists, we don't know if this person was a combatant, and even more critically, it is quite an admission that Israel would target a convoy of seven innocent humanitarians to kill one armed combatant. Of course, this attitude would explain how Israel has managed to kill over 30,000 civilians in one of the costliest wars for children, journalists, doctors, and aid workers in modern history. As we've learned over the last six months, the mere allegation of a Hamas presence, even if unproven, is enough to justify destroying hospitals, schools, cemeteries, homes, and kids. Now, it should be clear that Hamas was nearby is also considered a good justification for killing an American citizen. Now, the competing narrative is no more satisfying than the first. The basic gist is that the three bombings of the WCK convoy was simply a, quote, tragic accident. Not only does this narrative not fit with the argument that the shooting was justified on the basis of an armed Palestinian being spotted at the scene of the warehouse. It's also hard to parse the exact nature of this alleged mistake. Given that the cars were clearly marked, were driving along a cleared coastal route, and had shared their location with the Israeli military, it strains credulity to believe that Israel didn't know exactly who they were bombing. Note that this is not even the first time the World Central Kitchen staff had been targeted. On Saturday, an IDF sniper fired at a car headed to a food warehouse, hitting the car's windshield. The World Central Kitchen immediately filed a complaint with the IDF and demanded that Israel guarantee their safety as it distributed food in coordination with the Israeli government. Two days later, the Israeli military, of course, killed seven of their staffers. The case for this being mistaken identification is also undermined by how frequently Israel brags about their intelligence capabilities and the sophistication of their weaponry. In a viral video from last month, we got a demonstration of this Israeli drone sophistication as we watched a drone track and kill four unarmed Palestinians. Yet the expectation now is that the clearly marked vans whose location was shared with the Israeli government were simply mistaken for... What exactly? Just look at this photo of one of the attacked vans. Now, I understand how it could be difficult to read a logo when you've blown a neat hole right through the middle of it, but what about its legibility seconds before? The only way the accident explanation makes sense is if the nature of the accident wasn't that aid vessels were targeted, but that at least one member of Hamas wasn't found alongside the seven slain civilians. In other words, the problem wasn't killing the innocent civilians, but that a Hamas target wasn't killed, too. 
it's not difficult to guess what motive Israel might have for attacking the aid workers. Recall that the World Central Kitchen had come to Gaza in the first place to replace the UNRWA aid that had been immediately cut after a mere accusation from Israel that four out of 30,000 UNRWA workers participated in the October 7th attack. No investigation, no reservation of judgment before cutting aid that millions of people on the brink of starvation relied upon. Of course, subsequent to that decision, a U.N. agency accused Israel of detaining and torturing UNRWA staffers to make confessions. But instead of reversing course, America recently made the UNRWA cuts permanent through 2025. Now, in the wake of the slaughter of seven humanitarian aid workers, multiple aid ships loaded with 240 tons of assistance have now turned away from Gaza, afraid of being killed. As refugee support organization Anera wrote, after six months of constant bombing and flagrant violations of international law, and with consultation from our Gaza team, Anera has concluded it's best to pause our operations. As it stands, currently delivering aid puts not just humanitarian workers at risk, but also those who are receiving aid. Our team in Gaza has determined that at this point, the risk of actively delivering aid is far too great. It seems Israel's actions have cut aid to Gaza yet again. What do you know? Now, if you're thinking the outright slaughter of an American citizen would provoke a strong response from the White House, if you're thinking that if an America cut aid to Palestine over a mere accusation about four employees being involved in October 7th, it surely will cut military weapons to Israel over the murder of foreign nationals. You'd be wrong. The Hill's Niall Stanich asked National Security Council spokesman John Kirby point blank yesterday whether firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them was a violation of international humanitarian law that would require the president to cease arms transfers to Israel. Listen to the response. The president on February 8th issued a memo and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that uh, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes, at this very early hour, that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose, and there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, that we continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. They have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. You heard that right. In the last six months, during which Israeli leaders have announced an intent to flatten Gaza and have destroyed over 70 percent of all Gazan homes by last December. They've killed over 30,000 people, including over 13,000 children, collectively punished the population by denying food and medical aid to those civilians and killed more journalists than have ever been killed in a single country over an entire year. Kirby says there have been no violations of international humanitarian law. None. Of course, the evidence that the attack was intentional, which Kirby claims doesn't exist, can be found in the IDF's admission that they intentionally targeted the vans because they thought Hamas was inside, the same justification Israel has used, by the way, to bomb every hospital in Gaza. The proof can also be found right on the top of the clearly labeled trucks with a missile-sized hole in the roof. And in the fact that the drone tracked the car convoy over two miles, picking off cars in the convoy after survivors ran for their literal lives from one car to the next. But why believe my lying eyes when John Kirby tells me everything's going to be okay? Israel is investigating itself. Just sit tight and wait for proof. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So what's the reaction from Israel's defenders? Zionist Bari Wise has defaulted to calling the drone assault on the humanitarian aid convoy a horrific tragedy. 
The New York Times described Israel's slaughter of aid workers in passive voice, quote, founder of World Central Kitchen says several workers killed in Gaza airstrike. We'll have to click through to find out by whom. Israel is apparently so insecure about negative media coverage that it's shutting down Al Jazeera, silencing those journalists that haven't already been killed or had had their families killed in Gaza. Meanwhile, Biden is weighing another $18 billion in arms transfers to Israel, including 25 F-15s. That fact makes a statement on the World Central Kitchen Massacre feel a little empty. Certainly, at least one U.S. diplomat with some insight on Biden cast some doubt on the president's sincerity when asked in a recent New Yorker interview whether Biden has, quote, the same depth of feeling and empathy for the Palestinians of Gaza as he does for the Israelis, former U.S. diplomat Aaron David Miller replied, no, he doesn't, nor does he convey it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Indeed. Compare the White House's reaction to the world's central kitchen slaughter to the drone attack on an American military base in Jordan earlier this year that killed three American troops in Jordan. Now, after that attack, Biden promised, if you harm a American, we will respond. The U.S. went on to attack 85 targets in Iraq and Syria, killing nearly 40 people in retaliation. Contrast that with how the White House responded to a question about whether there will be any accountability for Israel they are found to have violated international law in killing an American citizen. Two years ago, uh, the IDF killed uh, an Al Jazeera journalist. They said that that was a, a mistake, uh, that she was wearing a Mark Press vest. She was shot anyway. They investigated it and they uh, released the findings of their investigation, which found that they were at fault. Go they on. Uh, but my, my question, sir, is in that case, uh, these, the Israelis did not initiate any criminal uh, proceeding. In this case, if it's found that the marked convoy was deliberately targeted, if not with the first shot, but the second two shots, would the U.S. support uh, <coughs> criminal penalties? As I said, we would expect that uh, should there be a need for accountability, that account accountability be properly put in place for whoever may be responsible for this. But again, that's gonna, a lot of that's going to depend on the investigation. The fear is that all we'll get is an investigation. Just like in the case of American Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akla, a lengthy, detailed investigation serves to dim public outrage so that by the time a tepid admission of fault emerges, no one notices that Israel has been allowed to continue its pattern of illegal violence with impunity. By the way, Kirby was bending the truth when he suggested that Israel uh, responsibly investigated themselves after Abu Akla's killing. Israel admitted to killing her only after denying responsibility blaming Palestinian militants and eventually admitting that they accidentally killed her after several independent international organizations forced their hand. An accident. Another accident. How many more accidents before the international community holds Israel accountable for its crimes? Yeah, so Amber, this instance seems to be separate and apart and really break through, I think, for a lot of people, underscoring the consequences of the failure of accountability. This incident, the incident in which the IDF shot three Israeli hostages that were making their way back um, to Israel that had escaped. Um, and I think perhaps the two-week siege on Al-Shifa Hospital that just ended a few days ago, I think have been so clearly wrong that even people who might otherwise defend Israel's behavior no matter what, like Barry Weiss, have to acknowledge that this is a tragedy at the very least. There's no justification for killing people who are foreign nationals who, for reasons that I think are immoral, get more sympathy from the West. It's one thing to kill a Palestinian. It's another thing, regrettably, to kill three British nationals, an American citizen, uh, joint with Canadian citizenship, and the rest. So you're getting a response the likes of what you haven't seen before. Joe Biden actually called Jose Andres and reached out in a way that he hasn't to people who have known Palestinians who've been killed in the course of this conflict. So there is something different about this. But when you see the response from the spokespeople and you see that Biden 
at the, on the same day that all this is being reported out, is actively negotiating to send another $18 billion to Israel. It appears that even though you can wrest some kind of rhetorical concession from the Biden administration, it is increasingly feeling like nothing that Israel does will be any sort of red line or provoke any sort of change. I was really struck by John Kirby's response to the targeting of the aid truck, right? Because he said, well, there's no evidence that it was done intentionally. Um, and you pointed out in your radar that uh, they admitted to striking the truck because they believed that Hamas was inside. So basically, John Kirby is asking uh, critics to prove that they knew Hamas wasn't in the truck. And my guess is they probably don't have an audio recording from inside the truck beforehand of them saying, hey, guys, let's kill these aid workers. <laughs> I mean, just the burden of proof that he places on these incidents is obviously insurmountable. And it seems like that's part of the point. Yeah, I th that's right. And to be clear, there's just no argument here. The Israel admits that the only intel that it has that would put Hamas on the scene is that Hamas, not even Hamas, an armed person. And we're talking about Second Amendment rights and the like. I mean, having a gun doesn't mean you are marked for killing. So an armed person being at a warehouse where the food truck at also was, there was no intelligence except that they saw a, an eighth person, a non-humanitarian worker, get into one of these trucks. And even if it were true, it's a kind of tacit admission that Israel might think it was appropriate to murder all of these foreign nationals and a Palestinian if it meant that they could get one militant. And if those kind of numbers are acceptable to you, then of course it explains how you get to a place where you have 13,000 children killed, where you have every hospital in Gaza bombed, where you have every educational institution in Gaza bombed, where you have cemeteries where people are already dead being dug up and excavated because there's, they argued, and the CNN exposed this, they were arguing that there are Hamas tunnels underneath the cemetery that they also were unable to substantiate. So I do think this is a really like eye-opening moment for people because at the beginning of this conflict, remember, the discourse was, well, Israel would just never do that because it's a moral ar army, it's a moral country. How dare you suggest that we would ever bomb a hospital, cut to every hospital in Gaza being bombed, I think in part because it was those early ones were a test of whether or not they could move forward in that vein with impunity. The U.S. government said, you can. The U.S. media class largely said, you can, and we're going to keep writing these passive voice articles obscuring who is doing the killing, who is the cause of this murder. And now we've gotten to this maximalist point where you have a million people refugees within a refugee population in Rafah and Israel threatening any day now to go and do the kind of ground invasion that they just did on Al-Shifa Hospital and which resulted in what has been described as a horror show of dead bodies breaking down, rolled over by tanks, beheaded, um, half buried and excavated by the Israeli military, a doctor killed, people, civilians bound and gagged, and all of the rest. That is what is on the horizon, I think, precisely because it was allowed at Al-Shifa. If it was allowed at Al-Shifa, why wouldn't it be allowed in Rafa and the rest of the, of the rest of the population? And who has blood on their hands for not demanding accountability before that likely eventuality takes place? Well, thanks for breaking this all down for us in your radar today, Brie. Very instructive. We're going to be back with more Rising after this.